Good evening, everyone. Thank you for your attendance to our final speaker. All the speakers. This evening, we have a guest from Google, Sergeant Court, and Coach Nadal over in Washington, Oregon, Coach Product School. Sargun, thanks for having me here today. Uh, and I'm just going to talk through a little bit about my journey um, into computer science. I work as a software engineer on Google Photos. If you're not familiar with it, it's like the best app ever, and they don't pay me to say that. It really is. Uh, we'll talk about it a little bit more later on. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm a Bay native. I've grown up in Fremont, so it's not too far from here. I went to Mission San Jose, uh, high school, went to Cal after that, and then ended up um, doing my internships in San Francisco, and then ended up um, in Mountain View working at Google. So literally always, always been here. Um, and we're going to talk about overcoming imposter syndrome and then going to work on building apps that over 800 million, I think, as of today or like this week, people use. Um, Google Photos, our daily actives are like climb up every day, so I'm not sure how many people just, but it's a lot of people all, all over the world. Uh, I'm going to start very young. So what got me into computer science today? pop out of my mom and be like, okay, I'm going to be a computer scientist. We have that down. We're, we're sure doing that. Um, this quote uh, was really important to me as I was reading it. Knowledge emerges only through invention and reinvention. Through the restless, impatient, continuing, hopeful inquiry human beings pursue in the world, with the, with the world, and with each other. The things that popped out at me were these words. Invention, reinvention, restless, impatient, and inquiry. These are some of the things that I unknowingly was pursuing um, throughout the course of my academic career. So this is me in sixth grade. I was super creative. Uh, I loved doing art projects. Anytime like anyone needed to do a poster, I would be the one who would like write the words all pretty and like add flowers and stuff. So in my head, I was like, if I could to be an artist or do something like that, that would be amazing. Uh, but I did come from an immigrant family, a uh, brown family, who's like, artist, what? You can do that on your free time. Um, and they were so, but I also loved math and science and so forth. Um, but I never really like thought about like what that meant. I was just like, I like these things, I'm going to do them. I like to read as well, I read a lot of books. Um, but as I progressed further and like looked back at my sixth grade and so forth, um, these are a lot of the things that made me who I am today. And like the things that make me succeed at my job today. Um, this is when we had to like, we had a wax museum in our sixth grade, so we had to dress up as someone and like act like them, and then you put, they would put their hand on the book, and then you start speaking. It's pretty cool, but it a lot like got me thinking and do critical thinking, how to think out of the, outside the box, uh, which was really neat. Then in high school, I was editor of my school paper. Uh, so that involved a lot of business acumen, like just like I was uh, handled, handling advertisers and like uh, talking to external people, talking to a lot of higher up people, and we sometimes got to do celebrity interviews. So it was like a lot of preparation, but like going out there, making sure I had everything going uh, like right, and then like asking the right questions and dig digging further. But it also led to a lot of like random disasters where like hey, like, we have to send to the printer tomorrow, and like, we don't have this ready, how do you solve this? How do you like, get into that mode um, and problem solve your way through it? Um, and it seems like all these things are not related to computer science, but eventually we'll get to the story where all these things really helped me, and some, all these things I use in my job today, leadership skills, business skills, 
art skills and so forth, uh, and communication skills. So this is me in our like little editor's room. Um, and then uh, after high school, we got to thinking, okay, now I guess I have to pick what I'm going to do. Um, and I was the type of person who was like, well, I know for sure I'm not going to be a computer scientist or engineer. Because I know they sit in desks all day, and they're little cubes, and I know this because my dad was a computer scientist. So growing up, I'd go visit him, and he'd have his cube, and like eventually an office or whatever, but it was really boring people doing really boring stuff that I didn't understand. And then he'd come home and like sit on his computer and tap into this black terminal, and like I just was like, there was zero appeal for me. And I was like, at least I have that out of the way. I don't have to be, I'm not gonna be a computer scientist. So I did a lot of bio research um, in high school. I did marine biology research. I loved water. I loved like swimming and the beach and everything. I'm like, I'm gonna be an environmental scientist, which is what I went ended up going to Cal for. Um, I started off as an environmental scientist. My first semester, I took like a chem class, a bio class, a math requirement, and then you realize, well, I hate this. I hate memorizing. I'm not cut out for like sitting in labs. I'm not going to do this. But I'm like taking on all these chem and bio classes, and my GPA is just sinking and sinking. Um, and then um, this is sophomore year, second semester, which I, at that point I have still not taken a computer science class. I uh, have no idea what I'm going to be doing with my life. Um, and Cal, uh, my which we'll call it. My, uh, my counselor was like, yeah, we're going to kick you out of school if you don't declare a major um, by next semester. Uh, at this point, I've taken like a myriad of like uh, chem, bio, cog sci, like everything under the sun, trying to figure out what I want to do. And I'm like, I want to be a doctor, and I'll be a writer, and I'll be like environmental science. So it was like really, really confused. I had like a unit or two short my sophomore year, so I decided to take this like not even an intro to CS, but it's like the basics to CS. It's like they teach you with like basically Legos. Um, that's like how introductory this class was. It was like a two unit class. I was like, okay, I'll take it. And my dad's like really pushing me to do CS. I'm like, yeah, I'm not that child. Like you can, I'm not gonna do CS and I'm actually never gonna do it because you told me to do it now. Um, so I get into this CS class and it's actually pretty cool. I'm like. And the cool, the cool part was like, I never thought about like, how does the internet work? Like I use this profusely, I use this feature, I use this tool, but like how, I like, never sat there and thought about, how does it actually come together? And that class kind of got me thinking towards that direction. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And then we got to take a field trip or a day trip and you shadow an engineer at Microsoft. So that day I shadowed an engineer who's working on PowerPoint and I was like, Whoa, so like that button on the PowerPoint and like presentation, like you like made it happen. And it was like all these like things clicking together and I thought that was really, really interesting. And that was really cool because uh, I was a critical, like I love doing critical thinking and problem solving and I was all connecting together. So lo and behold, come junior year, first semester, I had to declare a major and I was like, ah, oh, whatever. Okay, computer science it is. Uh, I declared computer science having taken none of the requirements, uh, so sorely behind. Uh, and uh, that started my journey into imposter syndrome and understanding what that was. To give you a little bit of background, Cal CS classes range from 800 kids to 1,500 kids, introductory. Um, it felt like to me like I was the only one who didn't know anything that was going on in class and that every other guy in the class, which was like 95% of the class, had been coding since like two years old, five years old. I just knew it and then I was constantly behind, constantly like struggling to catch up, trying to get the grade, not knowing what's happening um, and taking like class after class to fulfill requirements so I was like bunching up on a lot of classes. Uh, and that was the smartest decision um, either. Um, but I landed an um, internship uh, that summer um, at Symantec. And I landed it um, through a school club, the Society of Women Engineers um, Club. They were having like a career fair. I handed out my resume. They had taken one CS class at that point. 
Um, and I really enjoyed that, that environment. Um, I spent a summer there. I was actually a QA intern. So what a QA intern is, um, or a QA engineer, quality assurance engineer is, they don't actually do a lot of coding right at the beginning. They um, do automation or script writing, and they do a lot of testing. So that was like my slip in into engineering. Like I wasn't like ready to start doing hard hardcore coding because I had only taken one class. Uh, but that was my slip in into just like the environment and the culture um, of what a tech company looks and feels like. And that was in the city. Um, and I just want to pull out this uh, metric. Um, I think this is from 2015, where 18% of women um, get a degree in computer science, even if they've taken like higher level math and science courses. Um, and I didn't know of this. I ended up stumbling through computer science, uh, as I told you. But it really made sense because I felt like the odd person out in a lot of my CS classes. And my mantra to myself, all throughout my two years of, like the second two years after declaring computer science was like, you know, I just gotta get through this and then I, I won't have to do it. I just have to graduate, I just have to graduate and then I'll figure something out. Like I'll do something else, I'll end up doing art, I'll do whatever. Um, so that was my mantra. Um, at my internship, it was a lot of cool people of different age ranges, different backgrounds, and that was a space I hadn't been in before, which I really enjoyed. <laughs> Usually in school you're like, with the same age group, or same type of friends, same, um, working with the same age range, or so forth. And that was a space where the first time I was interacting with a lot of people with a lot of different backgrounds, and it was a lot of fun. We also had a lot of offsites and parties, and all this crazy stuff, and I just thought, like, this is not my dad's office. What, my dad was totally, like, selling me the wrong idea. Um, so that was really great. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we're going to define imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is, a is uh, the collection of feelings of inadequacy that persists despite evident success, uh, evident success being um, subjective. Um, but uh, yeah, so I was starting through computer science, but I had this internship that I really, really loved. I ended up working part-time um, through my junior and senior year, going into the city Tuesdays and Thursdays, working part-time, because I really enjoyed it. Eventually, after being a QA intern, um, I did a research intern position where I got to code more and do a lot more projects um, in, that, in that space. And this was uh, what I, at the end when I graduated what I was thinking about. When you look at computer science today, it applies in everything, in anything. So you look at fashion, you're looking into computer science, like how do you incorporate lights and LED lights into fashion? How do you, the Kate Spade actually just recently launched a purse where you put your phone in your purse and it automatically charges, which is a problem most of us have, right? So how do you get, um, there's a, a coat that constantly keeps you warm, right? And that's all integration with computer science and fashion. You look at the NBA, you look at any of the sports industries, and they're doing statistics and, and all sorts of like data models that use computer scientists and are employing computer scientists. Um, and the same goes for gaming, entertainment, um, like any of these random careers. So at the end of it, I was like, if I do computer science, I can still have like multiple opportunities. I wasn't really closing any doors. I was just getting a foundation built. Um, that being said, uh, after I graduated and I actually ended up uh, taking my first job at Yahoo, which uh, RIP does not exist anymore really, uh, it was just brought out. Um, but this is what it felt like. It was like, hey, uh, here's, can you please like do this project? Here's a little guideline on how to do it. And then like, this is how you do it. And I was just like pushed into this job that wasn't really supportive. Uh, we were doing like building out this like new search school and Yahoo search. Um, the team wasn't really like all together, and I was coding in PHP. I had never done PHP in, in college, um, so it was all in all a big disaster. Uh, and flared out my imposter syndrome for sure. Uh, and I was like, okay, I guess this is what it's like to be an adult, and it sucks. Um, I had like no friends to eat lunch with, and it was just like, it was really not my vibe. Uh, and, uh, oh. and then I um, was there for about four months, 
um, struggling really hard. Um, I had interviewed at like 30 bajillion, more like 30 places um, before graduating from college, Google being one of them. Um, and I'd stacked my interviews, this is like a pro tip, um, is stack your interviews if you do like internship interviews or full-time interviews, stack them to the companies that you want to actually land at, like they're at the end of your cycle kind of. So I like, did all these like startup interviews at the beginning um, of the semester and then like Google was the last interview of like 30 after three months of interviewing. And so I was like in the habit of doing like whiteboard coding and like all this stuff had like done a whole range of questions at that point. Um, to give you reference, my first interview for a full-time position I think was at, with Airbnb and they asked me like a whiteboard question which is like a graph question so like binary search or something and I totally tripped out like was like stuck on this one question and then like two months later was my Google interview. We had five interviews um, on site and it was like dynamic programming and this and matrix and this and I can't even remember because it, it was from traumatizing. But like I had it down at that point um, because I wasn't nervous on front of being on a whiteboard. Um, so that really helped me out. Um, that being said, I still didn't get a Google offer. Um, I talked to my recruiter and she's like, hey, uh, you did pretty well, you didn't do well enough. I was like, okay, well I wasn't really sure I was going to get it anyways. Um, but four months later into Yahoo, my recruiter ended up calling me back for a new program they were starting at Google called the Engineering Residency Program. And that was basically um, a program that I would say like saved my life. Uh, but essentially, the, they're starting a new program where full-time engineers would come to Google and they would rotate through two or three different teams for four months each, so like do a rotation, and then end up selecting what team they really enjoyed and what team they really liked. And that seemed to be something I really wanted to do, having been on a team that I didn't like at Yahoo and something that didn't like work out for me. So I ended up quitting Yahoo fairly early, after four months, um, and joining Google. So this is what the life of a typical Googler is. Um, a Googler is what we call new Googlers and you constantly feel like a noodler sometimes. But you come in and it's like, it's like a fascinating environment. Um, it's like shuttles and food and all these cool people. It's like the guy who created the internet just walking by and like, like these amazing people all around you. Um, and they're super supportive. I think one of the things I learned after being at, doing my internship, going to Yahoo, and then finally going to Google was just like the types of people that I've met at Google, I've yet to met me, a mean Googler, which is really, really odd to say, but they've always been super, super supportive. Um, I work with engineers who've been working in the industry for like 15 years, who are like super brilliant, super smart, have like their patents lying on their desks, um, like these little like trophies of their patents and stuff, and they're like, it's like intimidating, but it's also really cool because they're so open and collaborative. Um, and that really helped in like conquering my imposter syndrome. Because going to someone and asking, like being afraid of asking a stupid question and realizing, hey, you're like, hey, I totally had the same question, or hey, let me help you out. Um, that really helped me build my um, like just confidence um, and succeed at uh, being an engineer much faster. But as we go through this arc, this is like usually a graph they show us um, in our like introductory Google days. And then you like hit this low point where you're like, oh my god, there's so much to learn. I'm pretty sure they're speaking a different language. Excuse me. Um, they're like all speaking acronyms. Like any team you go to, any team meeting you sit in, they're all speaking in acronyms. And you're like, I'm pretty sure I didn't learn this language. I didn't know I was supposed to. And it was just really odd. Um, and then eventually, like, because of the environment you're in, um, you start asking for help and you like feel good. And then a lot of it was like mentoring others and having good mentors myself. Um, one of the things I failed to do as a college student was seek out a mentor for myself. Um, had I done so, maybe I would have been more prepared and never felt like always being behind. Um, I had never applied for a Google internship while I was in college and I didn't even know those. Like I felt like they existed. But I was like, I'm not up for it, I'm not smart enough, I can't do it, so I never even tried. Um, but had I had a mentor who was like helping me or like coaching me, um, that would have helped a lot. Um, I have two mentors at Google right now, even though I'm into Google, I'm on this phenomenal team, um, my mentors still seek, like help me out every day, like do anything that's happening. 
um, and they have been really supportive in my career. So one of my biggest advice is, is to be a mentor for someone else because that helps you like conquer your imposter syndrome yourself. You're like helping someone else, you're like, hey, um, you're getting feedback, like that's been helpful to them, and so you gain your own confidence. But also having a mentor helps you solve a lot of like your own inquiries. Um, and eventually that this craft like levels out because you launch a product. I remember the first feeling um, when I launched one of my like really big features. Um, I was like, oh my god, something's gonna go wrong, something's gonna go wrong. And this is like we're launching to Google level, right? So immediately like whatever, 800 million people, 1 billion people are going to see this feature. And just like staring at the graph and staring at the crash rate reports and like how these two things up and I'm like, something's going to go wrong. And this is a feature I had like done myself. It was all like, it was like multiple people on the team. It was something I was doing myself. And it was so scary, even having like been at Google, having made it to Google. And I was like, they're going to fire me. Like something's going to go wrong, something's going to go wrong. And it like worked out fine, and then you see like people in Mexico or people in Indonesia or people in Brazil like using your feature, and you're like, this is crazy. Um, uh, and that was really powerful. Um, so this is a little bit about my life at Google. Clearly, uh, this is what I do all day. This is a we had like a Harry Potter um, maze day randomly, like movie night, um, and then. Uh, Google's so big, they feed you and they have like, we have like 36 cafes on campus. And one of the things you can do is you can do like a pastry internship. So I spent four hours in the kitchen, like making brownies, like elbow deep. Um, so there's a lot of cool stuff that happens that keeps you like engaged in doing a lot of other stuff. Um, these are my parents at uh, Take Your Parents to Work Day. So they don't really also have Take Your Parents to Work Day yearly. So my parents are, are visiting me. Um, um, which brings me to my current team. This is my third team at Google. I was on Google Maps before and an internal team before that, but this is uh, the team I've been on for over a year and a half now, specifically on the Android side. So to run you through kind of my day-to-day -day and my team, my team's about 300 people. So if uh, Google Photos, it's a mix of Marketing, user research, design, back end, front end, iOS, Android, managers, like everything under the sun like that comes together to get an app shipped uh, worldwide. Um, let's see if we can play this video. This is a quick video on Google Photos. And get deleted off your device, leaving you more space on your device. So that's actually a feature that I particularly uh, worked on. 
Um, we're launching a version two of it, and that's actually got launched uh, two weeks ago, and that's something I worked on on the Android side uh, by myself. Um, so that was a really cool experience, um, which we'll talk about. Um, generally, I can't give, like, go into the details exactly of our infrastructure, but like on a high level, this is what Photos does, right? You take a picture, and we charge you if you like want to save your original quality picture up to like after 15 GB. But the way Google Photos handles um, images and the reason we can do it for free is because when you upload to Google Photos, we compress your photos. So we compress them to high quality resolution, which is fairly good for most users um, who just want to like you know have reminiscent pictures or nostalgic pictures. Um, and then once we compress them, uh, we do like all sorts of like understanding of that image, right? So we understand who's in it, what's it doing, how can we categorize them so that when you want to search for your dog or your cat or your mom or your friend, we instantly can pull it up. Um, and that all happens server side later. Uh, um, and once we're able to process them, then you get like animations like this, where I took three pictures um, in sequence and Google Photos automatically like made it into an animation. And I thought it was fitting because I'm not a muggle, clearly, and I have magical photos. <laughs> uh, but that being said, um, how do we build for the world, right? So what happens when you don't have instant Wi-Fi and like super speedy Wi-Fi connections and great awesome phones? Like what happens to the rest of the world that's still catching up or doesn't have 4G, 3G, et cetera? Um, so you run into low connectivity problems, and they have limited data plans, or you're, do you just build an app for English? Like, what about everyone else out there, like, who English is their first language, or English isn't a language that you understand at all? Is this not an app that they can use, or is this an app that they have to figure out themselves how to use and, to, like, you know, play around with? Um, and so a lot of the problems we see worldwide is, hey, less people are backing up their photos, and if you think back to that model I just showed you, um, if less people are backing up their photos, we can't do image processing on our server of them, and then we can't give them like cool animations or um, have them like have instant search and all these other cool features. Uh, so how do we solve this problem? Um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, what I get to do, or like where our ideas and um, come from. So as of a month ago, two months ago, I just came back from a research trip to Indonesia. So this is like a Google paid, fully like funded um, trip. Um, and we went to Indonesia, it was a team of five of us, and we went to people's homes. So we went into people's homes of Photos users, we sat down with them and we're like, Okay, like, show us how you use photos. And we just, like, took a back seat, but they would show us, like, hey, I think this is how I back up my photos. Most of them were, like, backing up their photos to laptops still because they didn't, like, understand the concept or they didn't have Wi-Fi at all. Um, so we did a bunch of diary studies, in-home studies, retail interviews, and so forth. Um, and we, it was a really cool experience, actually. We had a translator with us, and then we were hooked up into mics. And so we're getting like instant feedback because like a translator was like translating everything they were saying and we were taking notes furiously to help understand the users. So when you're like thinking about building an app, um, I guess my advice is like kind of think bigger than your picture, right? Like people all over the world are going to be using it, but it's not necessarily true that they're going to have all the same environments that you've grown up in or you've gotten used to. Um, and these were like, though we focused on lower economic neighborhoods, it was it, it, like most of them didn't have Wi-Fi access. Like they all just used like their like really cheap data plans, and they all used phones that I've never heard of or never tested on. Um, specifically, when you're building on Android or iOS, um, you're dealing with like right to left languages or left to right languages, right? And you're dealing with smaller phones, bigger phones. So you have like when you're testing a feature, you can't just be testing on like the the next pixel phone and like that works really well and has a big screen. You're testing on smaller screens. What does text look like? Does it look all crumpled up and like a bad user experience? Uh, what do colors look like and so forth? So you really have to like broaden your horizons when you're building up um, for something that you want the entire world to use. Um, and these user research trips really help us like connect with our users. One of the things I really love about working at Google Photos is like 
I have like a visual in mind of the user I spoke to in Indonesia, and now I'm coming back and building for that user, right? I'm not just like thinking up of magical ideas and like thinking like, oh, I'll work out for them. Like I have a specific user in mind, and I like that follow that entire user journey to building out a feature for them, which is so like it was really really cool. Um, to be able to connect those pieces, that I'm not just an engineer who gets handed an assignment and I have to like do it and I never know what the impact of it is. Like I directly got to see what the impact of a lot of my features were that I had built out. Uh, so these are some of the problems that like we're trying to fix or we're, uh, we're like thinking about. So we talked about that low connectivity problem, right? Of like having really l a large backup queues because they didn't have connectivity so all these photos are not being backed up. So we introduced the idea of manual backup. Like, hey, maybe you don't have enough data to back up all your photos. Maybe you want to back up like one or two that you want to like make sure they're saved on the cloud. So like I added this manual backup option, uh, but that was like one of my first projects on Google Photos. Um, another project that I just finished completing was like that new free up space pipeline um, that gets added. And it's this is a really interesting project actually because you see the animation of like sliding down, like you're like uh, someone who hasn't taken engineering, like I would go home and worked on this project for like six months. This does look like that big of a deal. It was like six months of like tires, tireless work because getting animations right on Android is probably the last thing I want to be doing. Um, but it was a really hard problem to solve. Like how do you get all these photos to like slide down e like seamlessly? It's like not easy work. Um, and getting that little pill shift. So this is like the biggest animation we added to our app. So no one on our team, like even the senior engineers were like, oh, this is an interesting problem. It was like, oh, great. Um, but it was a, like, a, like a really helpful environment. And, and um, this is what the feature that we ended up launching was. Uh, so this feature was like to make it more apparent that, hey, your backup is off, your photos are not being saved, um, and so forth. And now we're seeing impact of like more users like tapping on this and freeing up space and more users backing up their photos. So it's like little stuff like that, but often it takes like six months of work. Um, another thing that we should and we also design for is people with disabilities, right? So a lot of our users, um, like a good percentage of our users might have um, color blindness or might be visually impaired or hearing impaired. Like how do you build an app for, for those individuals? Um, and some of the things that we think about are, A, like when you're, if, I don't know if any of you have tested this out, but all of your phones have this option when you go into settings to do talkback. And talkback basically is, um, it, when you enable talkback, everything gets like spoken out loud. Like on the screen, it reads it out loud to you. So imagine going, um, so A, we have to tag everything on the screen. Right? We have to tag everything on the screen so when the talkback is initiated, um, everything is read out. Um, if there's an icon or a button, that gets read out. If you don't tag it, they don't see, essentially see or hear the button and they can't use that feature. So we have to make sure that happens. But also when you're thinking about colors, right? People with color blindness, if you don't have like, if you have like a really light white, like a light gray color on a white background, someone with color blindness might not see that or someone with like, vision impaired might not see that. So you have to make sure your colors are right. And that's where you talk with your designers and your engineers um, and other engineers on how to get, that, get those right. So these are things that I didn't know you were supposed to think about. No one talk, told me in college or school, like this is what you designed for. Um, and this is all on the job that we learned and I thought was pretty neat. Um, this is more about inclusive design, just like how we think about usability and accessibility and how do we, how do we bring that together to make inclusive designs for people of different backgrounds, different phone types, different accessibility needs, et cetera. Um, and these are things that um, we encourage everyone to think about um, when they're designing, when you all are designing your own apps. And that being said, so that concludes a little like the photos portion, portion of it. But one of my biggest things in college was when I thought about tech, when I thought about Google, when I thought about Facebook, when I thought about these like big idealistic companies, all I thought about was a dude sitting at a computer who was an engineer who was like hacking away on code. Um, and that was the only image I had of it. And I didn't realize, A, there was like so many different types of roles 
um, especially at Google, where we have scientists and biologists, and then we have photos researchers, and we have designers, we have artists, like all working in the same space to build out an app. Um, we have food engineers, we have um, like, uh, if you've heard of the Project Loon project, which are balloon, internet balloons that fly over um, remote areas, um, Google hired seamstresses because they, would, they had the best knowledge on like what fabric works together and what stitches work. Like, like everyone like in the world, right? Like there's a position, there's something that you could use um, in working in a space. Um, product managers, there's like, there are the vision boards that like bring ideas together. Like all these roles I didn't know existed until I got to Google. And that's my way of saying like you don't have to, be, like if you're not majoring in computer science or maybe if you're minoring in computer science but you're also doing like anything else including business or design or art, like you can merge those into t together and there's a role for you at Google um, for that. Um, I heard that y'all didn't like, weren't sure if like there was applications. Um, Google hires from everywhere. We don't like say like, okay, these are the four schools we hire from and, and like everyone else we just like throw out the file. Um, it really depends on like your acumen and your ability to like problem solve um, and your critical thinking skills. So if you go to google.com slash students, that's where you can find all your do like job openings, internship opportunities, um, everything is listed out there, so I highly encourage you all to like go there. Um, internships for next summer, so next summer internships start in May, May or June, depending on like when your semester ends. But those applications actually start in like September. Um, and so unfortunately, most of the applications have now closed um, by the end of October, early November, but I really encourage you to go back next year, make sure you go back on time. Um, I can talk into a little bit of detail about the different types of internships and job opportunities um, that exist at Google for freshmen and sophomores. Uh, we have a specific internship called an engineering practicum internship, um, and that's geared towards freshmen and sophomore um, in computer science. And basically, you get paired up with two mentors instead of just one um, to work on a project together, so it's pretty cool. Um, then you have your regular um, uh, SWE internships, SWE is a software engineer. Um, and those all of you can apply to. And then, uh, what else is there? There's also obviously full -time, for full time roles, you can apply at any time of the year. So if you're graduating this year or next year, like, feel free to apply at any point. Um, those applications are always open. Um, there's also scholarship opportunities. So if you go to google.com slash scholarships, I believe, um, you should have all the scholarship listings um, on there as well. Um, and then this is the program I was talking about, the engineering residency program. So it's a one-year program for uh, graduates. So if you're graduating, um, you can also apply to this program. And I thought it was a super interesting, like, great program that like really helped me build tools to succeed um, um, at my job uh, and provide the resources that I needed. Um, and make a lot of friends because like it basically brings you in with a cohort of people your same age and like who had just graduated. So I ended up making a lot of close friends through this program and generally at Google. Um, a lot of my best friends are now at Google. Um, and that's it for me. Um, do you have questions? Um, I can tell you a little bit. So this is a picture from Indonesia. Um, this is our UX researcher and our marketing um, person. Um, I can talk a little bit about Cal actually. So Cal, like I told you, had like upwards of like 800 kids in my classrooms, um, and that really was a struggle for me. Um, and I felt like if I went to a different school that really catered to me, um, I might have had a different experience because I still like struggle through my imposter syndrome. Like, hey, I'm not good enough, or hey, like I should have done this like faster or quicker or better or something. Um, my sisters actually are interning, um, one of them, they're twins, one of them, both of them are uh, studying computer science at San Jose State. Uh, they're sophomores right now, and they both actually, one of them interned at Google last summer after the freshman year through the engineering practicum research, uh, engineering practicum internship. And uh, one of the really cool things about Google internships is that you can intern anywhere. So Google has offices like everywhere around the world. I've been to 13 offices, um, including Zurich, Paris, um, uh, there's other ones I've been to abroad, I think, and then Rome, I think. And then, um, but everywhere else in like New York is one of my favorite offices, Seattle, 
Austin, Chicago, like they have offices everywhere, so they have interns everywhere as well. And it's a fully paid internship, you get a stipend for living expenses, your food's on campus. Um, I, I always say interns get treated better than full-time engineers, um, and full-time engineers get treated pretty well. Uh, so I highly encourage all of you to apply. Uh, my sister went to San Jose State and did one year of computer science, um, and she got that internship. So like, it's really dependent on your critical thinking skills, on your motivation to apply for these things um, and set out to get them. Uh, there's a lot of online like mock interviews and mock questions. Like if you study up on those, like that will get you into that mindset of interviewing. Um, I think interviewing is like a separate class altogether. Like you might be a brilliant computer scientist, but interviewing just takes a different skill of being in front of someone and like um, having the, like the ability to like whiteboard and think on the spot and ask questions. Uh, one like tip about interviews at Google like. We don't like expect to like give you a question and be like, okay, like I want the perfect solution immediately right now. We want to see you work through it because that's what I do on my day-to-day -day job, right? I get this problem and like I work through it. I usually like end up googling how to do half of it. Um, so it's a lot about like asking people or writing tests and breaking things. Um, I've broken a lot of things at Google. Uh, one time I broke the sharing button on Drive and no one could share anything. Um, so there's a lot of great stories like that. Uh, but it's a lot of like failure and succeeding totally and slowly. So that's what we want to see on your interview skills as well. Like, hey, are you asking the right questions um, from the interviewer? Are you like making yourself like, your way through the problems and talking through them? Um, yeah, so does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Uh, so when you broke the share button, how quick do you realize that and how like, long does it take to fix it? Yeah, so when I broke the share button, what happened was someone, uh, I was uh, working on maps. And so you can share like Google Maps through Drive as well and I broke it through that and it ended up breaking for everyone. Um, and immediately, so we have this, we have multiple roles. One is like a software engineer. One is software engineer in test. And these are all people that write code, but we just have different roles for them. And one we have is a site reliability engineer. And the SRE is the one who like manages servers and like manages like making sure all of our production is going okay. Um, and probably within like, I want to say within the hour we like figure that out and like there was a spike and something they like channeled it to the right person. Um, and you just see a lot of like flood of like complaint like reports coming in. One of the really cool things actually is because you're saw, like you're launching an app for a billion users, a lot of times what we do is we do like 1% experiments, right? We do like, we change the content or we change a button and we launch it to 1% of our users and we get a lot of feedback pretty instantly already because that's like 100,000 users. Um, and with that we can test out like, hey, this worked or this didn't work and then apply it to everyone or not apply it to everyone. Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions? Yeah, so uh, the way we do 1% experiments, they're called A-B studies, um, and so that's, that's, a, that's like a pretty general term in the industry is to do A-B experiments or A-B studies. You might have seen like on Facebook or Instagram, like, hey, you might have a feature before your friends do or something like that. Um, and we're able to route, um, like we flag gate our, uh, uh, we flag gate, um, uh, our launches or our experiments and we're able to route to like, hey, we have like 100 people in this bucket, but we only want one person in this bucket to like see this feature. Yeah. <laughs> and we make so many decisions off of that, right? Like we're like, at this point, I'm like, just like on one feature, I'm running five experiments, right? Like as of today, for like five different types of like, uh, different like wordings, different colors, like little things like that make the biggest difference, which would surprise you and it did to me. Yeah. Do you see yourself working at Google for the rest of your career? Uh, that's a question that you pretty much instantly start getting asked after you like work at Google for a year. Um, but um, I think about it a lot. The one thing great about Google is 
I've worked at three different teams. So I feel like I've worked at three different companies, kind of, in the course of my three years. So there's a lot of flexibility. So um, on average, after 18 months, um, they encourage you, if you want to leave the team and go work elsewhere, like, you're allowed to do that. Um, you're encouraged to switch teams, you're encouraged to like switch offices, so it always feels like, hey, I have the ability to like work on a completely different team, so it's like little startups everywhere, so sometimes I feel like I'm going to work at a different office, like that's my goal for next year, is to maybe like move to the Paris office or something, um, yeah, don't have the greatest answer for that. They only hire, they only hire one. Uh, no, we hire, we have like 200 people that start every Monday. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Are these internships paid or? Yeah, these internships are definitely very well paid. <laughs> yeah. Uh, could you, how many internships do you need to have? Oh, how many interviews? Oh, okay. So um, for internships, the process is basically um, you have two phone interviews for, and then those are technical interviews, um, and so that's probably four questions or five questions, so two per interview. For full-time interviews, we do um, usually one to two phone interviews, um, and then we screen you there, and then you go out on site for five interviews um, for the whole day. So you have five different interviews, um, which basically take up the whole day. and I um, code them. Um, so we work pretty closely uh, with the US uh, designers and engineers. Any other questions? Yeah. Google, and Sundar is the CEO of Google, um, and 
One thing I want to say is like if you're in a bad position, if you're in a bad team, there's like better out there. And that's something I didn't realize when I was at Yahoo and I was like, this is, I'm not like, I'm not succeeding. Um, this is like, it's not so, a supportive environment for me. I thought this was it. Like this is what being an adult was like and you have to stick through it. But that's so not true. Like I ended up at Google Photos where I have an amazing mentor, have like amazing women that work on the team. Um, and it's a great environment. Um, our team and our VP like really value diversity. There's no one that like sits in cubicles and higher ups. Like a desk away is where my VP of Google Photos sits, and I sometimes walk up to him and be like, "Are we really doing this?" And like have whole conversations with, with him about that. Um, so it's a really open environment, and you have to seek it out. Unfortunately, like it's not true that like every every team and every company unfortunately has that transparency. But those they do exist. Any other questions? Oh, well, I'm going to Yeah. That's just typically how most people 
part. Yeah. So it's just like you give them a choice, you know, they're going to go, here's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Or, you know, I'll leave them yeah, and like, you have to think about it, it's just like when you're building products for the world, like if you have white men building them, yeah. like they're going to think that you're building products for white men. Like you end up like losing out on building for like all these other, or like thinking about ideas that like other people would have like benefited.